Well, actually, that was fun. Um, we were privileged to have Representative Ron Kine on the podcast here. Just a great guy, good, knowledgeable sportsman. I, I love how he kind of knew this stuff in and out inherently. You could tell it wasn't just something he learned yesterday. He uh, yeah, came from a lifelong sporting perspective. Yeah, I feel like it, it's very encouraging to me. You know, a lot of what we talk about with CWD – in this podcast and otherwise is a little doom and gloom or a lot doom and gloom. Um, but to see somebody, you know, in the halls of Congress that actually climbs up a ladder with their bow and sits there and either sees something, you know, one of us up there who is actually trying to champion something that's so important. And we're right on the cusp of actually having it happen, actually having this huge influx of money to do something about CWD. Yeah, it, it was really cool just hearing his enthusiasm and his intimate knowledge of it and just th that spirit and, and as frustrating as I'm sure he he understands Congress to be and we all do at times just that, that he still has so much passion and, and energy for it. And, uh, you know, we're I think folks will enjoy listening to this and we're going to give folks some of the nuts and bolts of that, uh, you know, legislation and kind of the the mechanics of that a, as we go on here further and in the show notes um so you can figure out how to get involved and he kept imploring folks to you know talk to your senators uh, this is a yeah. this is a bipartisan thing everybody's ab about doing something with it so it's time to get going yeah there's there's stuff you can do and it's simple yeah so take a listen uh representative ron kind from wisconsin the heart of whitetail country joined us and uh told us about his bill that, that passed with uh, on suspension vote in, in, in the House, which means uh, it was it just got a, a quick vote and it was something like 395 to 33 or something. It was a, it was a huge, overwhelming bipartisan majority. So uh, you get to hear about that, hear where it's going next, and uh, I think you're going to like this episode. Chronic Wasting Disease an always fatal and definitely complex neurological disease afflicting cervids across North America and beyond. More than 50 years after its discovery, the impacts of this disease are ramping up quickly while hunters are having to make tough decisions about how they hunt and feed their families. What does this mean for the future of big game hunting? What can be done to stop the spread and conserve our hunting traditions? The Chronic Wasting Disease Chronicles explores these issues with leading experts from around the country and looks hopefully to a future full of healthy, wild cervid populations. Brought to you by NWF Outdoors and Artemis. Welcome to the Chronic Wasting Disease Chronicles. Howdy everybody and welcome to CWD Chronicles. I'm here with my co-host, Ashley Chance. How's it going, Ashley? It's going good. Good, and we're, we're lucky today to have a really special guest. Uh, we have someone who's a, a devout sportsman himself and has really been out there on the front lines of this disease and in, in, in Congress, which is even more important because we really have to tackle this nationally. And today we're lucky to have Representative Ron Kine. Howdy, sir. How are you? Aaron, we're doing great. Ashley, great to be with you. Well, thank you for coming. First, I'm going to just tell folks a little bit about uh, Representative Kine, and then and then we'll dive in and, and let him tell us about his bill. So he's a native of La Crosse, Wisconsin. He's a representative of Wisconsin's third district. He's been a tireless advocate for hunters and anglers. You know, during his time as a congressman, he's been a, a member and is also the former chair of the Congressional Sportsman's Caucus, who we work with quite a little bit. And he's also a longtime sportsman himself. So. Welcome, Congressman, and thanks for coming. Aaron, it's my pleasure. Well, it's it's really ours as well. And first, we just want to give our folks uh, a little bit of a chance to hear about you and tell us about your sporting life and how you got interested in CWD. Well, unfortunately, I'm reporting from Washington instead of a deer stand back in Wisconsin. Actually, bow hunting season just finished up uh, in the state, and I'm an avid bow hunter. And this, I was born and raised in western Wisconsin the most beautiful congressional district in the nation, by the way. Uh, Ashley actually did some schooling in Wisconsin, so <laughs> somewhat familiar with the terrain back home. But I have more miles along the Mississippi River uh, than any other congressional member. 
Uh, it's a place called the Driftless Area uh, that was untouched by the glaciers. So we have a lot of rolling hills and bluffs, oh, yes. and valley, just just beautiful. And, and really just, big deer uh, there too. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and it just cries for outdoor recreational opportunity, from hunting to fishing to camping to uh, biking, um, all of that. And having been born and raised in Western Wisconsin, it's part of our DNA. Uh, I was born hunting and fishing and. And uh, today, uh, our family vacations with the boys are usually a, a long backpacking trip in the backcountry of national parks. Uh, and then we do uh, hunting excursions, too. I do own a 250-acre family farm just a little bit north of La Crosse, my hometown. And we do a lot of our whitetail hunting, turkey hunting, uh, pheasant uh, hunting tur- uh, uh, there. I'm an avid uh, 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 bull hunter. Uh, I love to do it. Uh, a happy day for me is uh, all day in a deer stand, uh, bull hunting in beautiful fall in Wisconsin. But I've also been out west in the Rocky Mountains doing some hunting there. In fact, just took a really nice six by six bull out a couple falls to go uh, in lovely Wyoming outside of Jackson. Horses up in the mountain, base camp. It was unbelievable. And I also appreciate the economic value of outdoor recreation and the hook and bullet crowd and what they do for jobs back home and throughout the country. And I remind my colleagues out here in Congress of that fact all the time uh, that we tend to punch above our weight as outdoor enthusiasts. And there's a tremendous amount of revenue that comes in for important conservation programs to revenue that hunters and fishers, uh, fishermen directly contribute to. And so uh, those are great programs that we watch very carefully and make sure that they're working well. Excellent. Uh, you're, you're right at home with us. We love all that stuff. Well, yeah. tell us a little bit about how you got interested in CWD the first time it kind of came across your radar and what, what happened. Well, you know, it impacted Wisconsin back in 2002 when the first CWD cases were being tested. Uh, uh, and it was obviously a scare. I mean, hunting in Wisconsin, it's uh, uh, just deer hunting alone is about a $350 million annual uh, industry employing close to 40,000 people directly uh, and the local economic impact. We had last hunting season, I checked, about 140,000 out-of-state hunters come into the state uh, just to deer hunt uh, for both bow and gun hunt season. Our gun hunt season is the week of Thanksgiving. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of us use it as a family bonding opportunity with uh, brothers and cousins and uncles, uh, aunts coming together for deer camp and opening morning. I mean, uh, sometimes you got to be careful. It's like the third day of the Battle of Gettysburg <laughs> with 800,000 hunters out in the <laughs> woods in the field. And you got to be careful with uh, each other. But uh, it's such a great uh, community event and a large part of our heritage uh, throughout Wisconsin. But yeah, CWD was detected and obviously it raised a lot of uh, alarms in the sporting community us hunters in particular, and we had to immediately step up testing regimes, uh, what we can do to try to prevent the spread of this terrible prion disease that's affecting brain cells and COVID animals, not just deer, but moose and elk, and what best uh, attempts to try to mitigate it and and prevent its spread. And so it's been a little hodgepodge out there from state to state in our respective approaches. Initially, there was such concern that our state DNR set up free fire zones to try to reduce the deer herds and thin out the population. You can imagine that wasn't too popular with the hunting community, just wholesale slaughter of whitetail uh, populations in Wisconsin. I mean, if you're a hunter and you go out and hunt, you want to see deer uh, while you're doing it and not be out there all day and not see one doe or buck walk by. And so I think we had to have a smarter approach to how we're going to best manage the fact that CWD uh, is in our servant herds and what's the best way of of, uh, eradicating it. And that was really the impetus, guys, of of the CWD Research and Management Act, uh, something that received uh, virtually unanimous support uh, out of the House, great bipartisan support here. As you mentioned, uh, Aaron, I've been very active with the bipartisan Congressional Sportsman's Caucus. It's the largest bipartisan bicameral caucus that we have in Congress with uh, outdoor enthusiasts like myself participating in it. And so with their help and the help of many other outside sporting organizations, we were able to get this legislation teed up and passed out of the House. And now it's uh, pending in the Senate with a couple of terrific sponsors, uh, Senator Martin Heinrich uh, from down in New Mexico, and also Senator Hoven are the chief sponsors in the Senate. And we've been working 
uh, very closely with them to advance the bill so we can finally get something to the president's desk for his signature. So knowing that you are an avid sportsman and you hunt in a state that where, unfortunately, CWD levels are pretty high in some areas, have you yourself ever harvested a deer that tested positive for CWD? You know, I haven't yet. And I, I'm pr- primarily in Jackson County, which is a west central part of the state, and it's not a high uh, incidence area. And, you know, the DNR has been doing a good job of tracking where there's high concentration of CWD uh, positive tests uh, of, of deer and they send out notices and then uh, try various mitigation attempts uh, in the state. But I've unfortunately been able to avoid that. Unfortunately, the only way you can test is with a dead deer. Uh, One of the purposes behind the legislation is see if we can get a live animal test uh, so you don't have to kill them first in order to do these tests. That may bring further knowledge on the spread of this prion disease and how it transmits from animal to animal. I I should also mention and make clear to your listeners that there has been no known human transmission of CWD. It hasn't jumped species in that regard, which is a great thing. But in Wisconsin, we do donate a lot of our venison to food banks, and they do require testing of the deer first before you do them as an extra precaution. And I've noticed in recent years that's reduced the number of deer donation uh, to, to food banks uh, back home, which is unfortunate because there's obviously there's a lot of uh, people and families in need uh, of that extra meat uh, in their household. And so uh, there's a lot of things that need to be addressed in testing for CWD, proper management uh, of it. I'm hoping this legislation too will spur open source collaborative research efforts th- by the universities that are currently doing research on prion. UW-Wisconsin is one, Washington, out in Colorado. They've been doing some good work on it, but not in the type of focused, concentrated fashion that we need right now. So uh, the legislation is meant to uh, cobble that together and, and, and call for more collaboration on the research so we can finally start getting better answers on how we can uh, contain and ultimately uh, defeat this disease. Absolutely. All of those things you mentioned are just of critical importance. I think it's wonderful that we're hopefully about to get a lot of funding to support them. One of the other things that the bill does is send a lot of money towards states and tribal management agencies, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And that's where it's best going to be handled, Ashley, at the state level. Got a lot of confidence in our various uh, state wildlife management agencies in Wisconsin, Department of Natural Resources. Uh, The states, I think, are going to be in the best position to be able to oversee uh, these surveyed herds, whether it's whitetail, whether it's elk, whether it's moose, and then uh, again through a, uh, a listening collaborative fashion put together management uh, uh, practices that you can get buy-in for. And we know in the sporting community that is so crucial that you do need to get buy-in from the hunters themselves in order for this to work and work well. And that's an important part of this legislation too, is that type of feedback that you can best get at the state and local level on what the state of Wisconsin, for instance, what practices we need to put in place in order to prevent the spread. I should also mention that CWD now has been detected in half the states, 25 of the states, and it's continuing to spread. So if you're a a non-CWD state uh, thus far, if you've got whitetail or or any elk or moose, chances are you're going to see it. It's going to show up at your doorstep too. So uh, the sense of urgency with this legislation uh, is an important factor too. Yeah, it is. And, and thanks for starting to jump in. But I want to give you the chance, right? Let's let's say the name again, Chronic Wasting Disease Research and Management Act. You introduced this back in October, passed on suspension vote with a large majority, very large majority, obviously excellent bipartisan legislation. But let's give an overview, kind of what were you thinking? You know, what were you aiming to do with this and kind of the big, you know, hot ticket items? What does it do? What does it aim to do? Well, first of all, I've been very frustrated as a hunter myself uh, that, that the only test that you can do with CWD is with uh, the, the brain of a dead animal. And I thought there's got to be an easier, faster way to get this type of feedback to us. Uh, first, the management agents, agencies and then us hunters in particular, as far as where the disease is located and where it's heading. And that way you can put together mitigation or management plans. Again, funding in this legislation will enable that at the state and local and tribal level on how best to manage uh, the spread of the disease and try to contain it uh, as much as it can be. And then ultimately, the the ultimate goal here, guys, is to try to find a cure uh, for this prion disease. 
Uh, and that too is important because heaven forbid, the last thing you want is for something like this to, to lead to humans. And then all bets are off when it comes to the hunting community, the economic impact that it provides, the revenue that's raised for conservation programs. That would be, as you would say, a huge disruptor uh, out there. And it's something to be avoided at all costs. So, again, I think the timing of this legislation is important. Seventy million over six years is a significant chunk of money that can help spur this basic and applied research that's desperately needed on CWD. So we have a greater understanding of it and perhaps there are some uh, undiscovered avenues that can lead to the eradication of this disease. I just want to, I want to reiterate what you said, $70 million over the course of six years. It's a huge amount of money. It's received a huge amount of support, like you said. And I just, I want to ask you, you know, CWD has been around for a long time. We've been trying to get a handle on it for a long time. Why is, what, how is your bill different? How is this bill different than previous attempts at trying to control the disease? I think, you know, whenever you get the federal government uh, involved in a collaborative fashion with state local agencies, it's a point of leverage too. So the 70 million uh, is a nice pot of money, but that can be leveraged back home uh, with state budgets, uh, with sportsmen's communities too. There's nothing preventing them from also contributing in certain areas to expand the reach uh, of this funding and what direction the research is going to go in. And I envision in the future just that type of feedback from the, uh, the sportsmen's community, the hunting community in particular, who obviously have a strong interest in all of this, uh, so that uh, they can be working with these research institutions, because they're going to be crucial uh, in regards to any research that's being done out in the field, and being able to work with particular hunters um, and their access uh, to these, uh, uh, to these uh, herds. So I am excited with the prospect. I think we've got two great sponsors in the Senate. Uh, they too have been very active in the, the, the bipartisan sportsmen's caucus in Congress, but it's not too late for your listeners to get in touch with their senators and ask them to uh, co-sponsor the bill that's, that's being introduced by Senators Heinrich and Hoven, uh, because the larger the number, the easier it will be then for that legislation to get on what's called the unanimous consent calendar in the Senate, which is kind of an expedite, expedited uh, legislative process to get a bill passed. And uh, we're hoping that will take place so we can get this down to the White House as quickly as possible. That's a good segue. And, and you, first, first, you you illuminated what I think a lot of our listeners know. The sporting community has stepped up kind of at every turn uh, historically for conservation, and we need to continue to do that. But second, you know, I want to take a peek inside your world. What are you telling senators and other colleagues who who need to be convinced a little bit on this? What are you saying to them? I mean, there's so many national priorities. There's a lot of things that need funding and resources. What are you saying to those folks to say, nope, this is the time. We need to get moving on this right now. Well, the fact that it is already affecting half the states, uh, so that's a huge voting majority in Congress uh, uh, that you're talking about. But uh, never estimate the, the, the cloud of the uh, Congressional Sportsmen's Caucus, and it is supported by uh, a plethora of outside sporting organizations, conservation groups, too. Us and included, the ability, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and the ability of them getting messages in to various representative and senator's offices and get uh, their attention uh, on it. But, uh, you know, listen, I think there's a recognition, a broad recognition in Congress, the importance of outdoor recreation, sporting community, hunting community in particular, and the type of revenue that's raised for important conservation uh, programs. You know, you got that Pittman-Robinson Act too. So any uh, ammo that's sold, lures that are sold, there's a portion of that that's collected, that's turned around and, and has to be dedicated to uh, conservation programs, or wildlife management, wetlands preservation, uh, all of that. Aaron, I think you've been active with the Trout Unlimited, uh, for instance, in the past. And that's a huge organization I'm working with all the time uh, back home on wetlands preservation uh, throughout the Driftless uh, area. Uh, and in fact, we helped create, uh, through the Water Resources Bill, uh, a regional uh, watershed management approach that uh, uh, Trout Unlimited is taking the lead on. Uh, and how we can best manage those precious natural resources that we have throughout the Driftless area and the upper Midwest uh, region alone. So I found throughout my years that those type of collaborative approaches to wildlife and conservation management programs, they work well uh, because you get buy-in. 
uh, from groups. And that's uh, essential uh, to success. So you've been a, a conservation champion for a long time, but a CWD champion for a long time. I feel like for a lot longer than a lot of other folks. <laughs> so can you can you kind of bring us back to the moment when you first recognized chronic wasting disease was such an important issue, such a big problem, and and why you touched on it a little bit already, but from yeah, a personal you know, perspective. Yeah, I don't know if you guys could see this, but I just you know brought one of these bad boy pictures with, and that of a, a nice. 12 point white tail buck that I took bow hunting, I scored 172 and I got my boys in there too. And nothing's brought me greater joy than being able to introduce my own kids to outdoor recreation and the hunting and fishing community and, you know, passing it on to the next generation because they're going to be the next generation of conservationists. And I remind my colleagues in Congress, you're not going to find any greater conservationists in the in the world than those who actually participate in hunting and fishing and understand and get that there's sustainability and the preservation of these species is important to our way of life. Uh, and so that's another selling point. Uh, but again, back in the early 2000s, I think it was around 02 when CWD was first detected in southwestern Wisconsin uh, in my congressional district, the, the DNR started setting up listening sessions with the hunting community. And you wouldn't believe uh, uh, these conference halls and how quickly they filled with concerned people from hunters and their families and uh, everyone in the community alike, realizing how dangerous this is, not just to their way of life, but to the economy and to jobs uh, in the area. And so there's a form of desperation that sort of, we were kind of operating blind without real good research on prion disease, the transmission, the spread, how dangerous this can be, whether it would wipe out our whitetail herds in Wisconsin. We, we just didn't know uh, how bad this was going to get. And so that spurred a lot of action. And I reached out to uh, UW-Wisconsin because they've got great research facilities there to see if they would start uh, dedicating some resources into exploring this a little bit more uh, with some basic uh, research. And they've been willing to step up as other universities uh, have been doing now. And, uh, but without the adequate funding, and again, one of the purposes behind the bill is to make sure that there is that funding uh, 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 getting back to the states uh, for this research purpose. Uh, we were still kind of shooting blind, uh, not knowing just how best to contain uh, this disease. And as I mentioned, you know, our initial response was free fire zones where there was a hotbed of CWD detected, which meant snipers coming in and just laying waste to the deer herds, not popular in the community, certainly not with the hunters taking that approach. It did lead to some changes in regards to uh, abating laws in Wisconsin. Uh, the intent behind that is to try to avoid huge concentration of deer in, in an isolated spot where it would be easy then for them to be able to spread the disease uh, amongst uh, themselves and, uh, you know, various techniques like that. And so I think we do need to do more of that uh, applied research in the field to find out which approaches are most effective uh, in trying to uh, prevent the spread of the disease and hopefully start rolling this back uh, at some point. Congressman, you continue to give me good segue material. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to ask, you know, Wisconsin, with that long history that Wisconsin has uh, of dealing with this disease, what do you think, you know, the, the best lessons that can be taken from Wisconsin? You, you have these new states that are just getting it now. You know, do you think there's lessons that other states can take to, to help initially curb the disease, you know, and get a handle on it as soon as possible? You know, what would you tell other states that are just dealing with it? Yeah, first of all, don't be afraid of testing. Just because you're not testing doesn't mean it's not there. Uh, and so just operating blind is not a good solution to all this. And in our state agencies that are in charge of wildlife populations, they need to get that feedback from the field. And that's only going to happen if you have hunters stepping up and willing to test uh, the animals that they take, that they harvest. And it's, it's a pretty simple process and it's free in Wisconsin. Uh, that way we're getting that data point back to the DNR and so they can, they can identify where it exists in the state and they can send out those type of warnings to, to hunters uh, and also asking them to start reporting deer that appear sick. Uh, it's another way of, of, it's not as accurate, it's visual, but it's another way of trying to track the spread of this disease with sick deer uh, in, in the region. And so there's a lot more that we need to uh, uncover, which is prion disease uh, generally. 
uh, but with CWD uh, specifically, given how widespread it's become uh, and the fact that half the states are already impacted by this. So one of the provisions in the bill is a, a review of the herd certification standards that are currently in place. Can you talk a little bit about what that entails and why it's important? Yeah, you know, this deals directly with the deer farms, and obviously that too is a big uh, a business out there. We have many of them uh, in Wisconsin, but and they've been willing to step up and do their own testing with their own uh, herds at, in these deer farms. Uh, there have been some instances of deer escaping from the farms, carrying CWD and infecting other wildlife herds uh, in the area. We don't want to develop that type of conflict between the uh, the deer farm owners and the rest of the hunting community. That's only going to set back the cause of the type of research and management plans uh, that we all need to be working on and develop consensus uh, uh, with. But we do know, obviously, with deer farms, you get a greater concentration of deer next to each other in these enclosed spaces. And therefore, if CWD uh, finds its way in, it's going to be much easier for it to spread uh, under those circumstances. I'm also very excited that in recent years, Wisconsin's been reintroducing elk herds uh, to the state. They were natural to our state before. Uh, they were ultimately wiped out. And now we've been bringing in various elk herds from uh, out west, but uh, in particular, Kentucky. And they naturally have to pass health standards before they can uh, enter the state. But uh, the elk herds are now starting to thrive. They're expanding in the state. Uh, you can imagine the excitement that that's uh, causing, and we still have very limited uh, uh, elk uh, hunting permits that go out. Uh, you can't believe the size of the lottery pool <laughs> that applies uh, for those hunting uh, permits, but it's going to be another great source of uh, business, job creation, and revenue uh, in the state. Uh, but it's not going to do any good if the elk herds start succumbing to the CWD uh, 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 fatalities. Yeah, absolutely. And I can see how having uh, a live test could be very beneficial in trying to get compliance with any herd certification standards that did exist. Yeah, I think that is going to be important uh, for rapid detection. That way you're not having to just rely on hunting season to bring in uh, results. This is something then that can be done year, year long. And uh, I think you're going to get much easier compliance, quite frankly, from community to community. If you can test live animals and get feedback rather than having to kill them first, because obviously there is a lot of waste in, in killing them uh, when there are healthy animals that are taken down and tested for CWD and, and they prove uh, negative uh, with those tests. So I think that would also um, allay some of the concerns within the hunting community. Uh, if we can develop that live test as opposed to just killing the, the herds off first. Well, what about, I want to ask one more question too. One of the things we we deal with on CWD is this kind of ebb and flow, you know, this dips in the funding cycle and, and this bill sets up, you know, six years, which is really great. But if you have any, you know, thoughts or philosophies on how do we smooth out those dips in the funding cycle? How do we continue? Because this isn't something that we're just going to be able to do six years and then it'll be gone. I mean, wouldn't that be great? But uh, to talk a little bit about, you know, the future there, how you see kind of the elements yeah. that we need to get to get going on that. Yeah, that's an important point, Aaron, and not to get into too much of the legislative weeds with all this, but what we just passed with this bill is called an authorized program that now is eligible for appropriation funding, the funds, $70 million. Ideally, the next step in this is to get permanent authorization of this program so it won't disappear after six years. And I think given uh, the unknown of uh, basic and applied research uh, out there, uh, you, you don't know how much you can advance within a six-year period. It may take longer than that. So uh, what we've been discussing already is the next iteration of this bill. Once we can get it out of the Senate and sign into law, uh, trying to work on a permanent authorization of this and then working with the Appropriations Committee, making sure we have sustainable funding levels to maintain this important research. The last thing any researcher wants to happen is there, for there to be a cutoff of funding and then they have to start over and they lose the important data that they've been collecting over a period of years. You want that continuity in the spectrum of research in order for it to lead to some significant breakthroughs. So that too is gonna to be another point of focus that we'll have to maintain. And I'm confident working again with the Congressional Sportsman's Caucus, uh, this will be you know, one of their priorities moving forward. 
Well, awesome. And, uh, you know, if you, if you talk to managers, it's, it's interesting because they talk about that, that issue. And it sounds like you've got, I like to hear that you have a vision on how, how we're going to do this and maybe permanently, uh, authorize this because I think that's been a frustration of a lot of folks. Like we, we start getting somewhere and then maybe the funding dries up or, or, you know, it, it just falls out of the public eye because it kind of dies down a little bit. So we need to keep that hot and I appreciate it. And, I think we, you know, I know you, you have to get rolling. You obviously have a busy schedule back there in DC, but can you talk a little bit about perhaps, you know, what you think the average hunter ought to be thinking about and maybe what actions they can take in your eyes to, to stay engaged here and, and keep this moving? Yeah, it's a great question. First of all, there's no reason to panic with CWD because we, again, we have not seen any transmission to human beings. So that's a good thing. But the concern is what's going to happen to these wildlife herds from our whitetail to moose and elk uh, in our country. And if this continues to go unchecked, it's only going to get worse for them. And that's going to diminish the hunting opportunities. It's going to have a direct job impact. It's going to have a revenue impact. Um, all bad things in these local communities that, that do rely on outdoor recreation as one of the stables of their uh, uh, economic framework. And we certainly appreciate that in the upper Midwest. Uh, Wisconsin has been a huge draw for whitetail hunters for, for many years. Uh, my county, where my family farm is, right next to Buffalo County, which is considered whitetail capital of the world, some of the biggest Boone and Crockett uh, coming out of uh, that county. And, uh, uh, and there are approaches now. There is promising research out there already being done that needs to be amplified right now. And again, it's one of the motivations behind the legislation try to get another 70 million over six years out into these research institutions, working with state, and local and tribal wildlife management agencies, develop greater coordination and, and develop greater consensus on what works and, and what doesn't work. Uh, because there's been a whole lot of experimentation out there uh, and in many respects blindly on what you can best do to prevent the spread of CWD. And it'd be nice to get good scientific uh, results and data uh, to back up best practices. And that's what we're really striving for here in the, in, in the next few years. Well, that's excellent. And we'll do our part. We'll, we'll get out action alerts and so on to, uh, Artemis and NWF outdoors followers and, and help them support the, you know, the Senate version of this bill and let's get this thing passed. And just thank you so much for all your, your advocacy and, and just bringing that, that true hunter perspective to Congress and, and letting those folks know how important it is to us. It's a, this is a critical thing. I, you know, I got a young boy too, as, as you mentioned, and he's 16 and he's concerned about this. You know, he, he's actually yeah. really concerned and it just gives you an example of, you know, when folks start learning it, it, it becomes a real thing for us. And our community is united in, in the desire to, to tackle this and you're leading the charge. So, uh, well, and Aaron, that's an important point too, because we're starting to see, unfortunately, a decline of youth getting involved in, you know, uh, in shooting sports generally, but hunting in particular. And that's not good because, uh, again, I think some of the greatest conservationists who I've ever gotten to know are those sportsmen who do appreciate the importance of protecting natural resources, proper wildlife management. You're talking the hook and bullet crowd that get this intuitively. And I, I, as I mentioned earlier, one of the greatest joys is introducing my boys to hunting and fishing and spending time with them in a little quieter format. You know, given how busy and hectic and crazy the world is today, my personal happy space is in a deer stand on our family farm in western Wisconsin, whether uh, I'm able to shoot a big whitetail or not. You know, just being able to spend a few hours out there to decompress and meditate, enjoy the wonders of God's creation. Uh, it, it really is a blessing that we have in this country that we shouldn't take for granted. And it's going to require you know active management and the active involvement of the sporting community, but also policymakers like me uh, who appreciate this. But we're going to need their help and we're going to need the listeners help to try to build more support for what we're trying to do with this legislation. Uh, and so, again, I encourage uh, the listeners to get in touch with your senators and ask them to join uh, Senators Heinrich and Holvin on the bill in the Senate. I wish I had a bill number. I think they're uh, introducing it uh, here shortly and there'll be a bill number shortly. But um, just by contacting offices, they'll be able to find all that. Excellent. Well, we're going to do our best to to drum up our, our folks and put some wind in your sails. And we appreciate it very much that you spent some time with us today. And please keep doing what you're doing. And 
let us know if you need anything from us and, and we'll let you go back to your busy life there trying to <laughs> trying to get our country moving. So thank well, you for thank your time, you. sir. Yeah, thanks. It's, it's a labor of love. So keep up the good work, you two. Great spending time with you. All thank you so much. Take care. Hey, everybody, it's Ashley. We hope you enjoyed this episode with Representative Kind. This bill's passage is critical in the fight against CWD. And since we last sat down with Representative Kind to record, there have been some developments that I wanted to update you on. There was an incredibly successful House vote of 393 to 33 back in December, and we are now expecting a bipartisan Senate introduction at any time. There are nearly an equal number of Republicans and Democrats ready to introduce the bill to the Senate. So we are eagerly awaiting that moment. The Chronic Wasting Disease Chronicles. A production of NWF Outdoors and Artemis.